Hi everyone, we're excited to have you join us on today's virtual tour, field trip to a net zero carbon house. As noted, this field trip will be recorded and later posted to our website. Berkeley Lab and SLAC, two of the Department of Energy's 17 national labs have partnered to host the virtual field trip seminar series called Exploring the World of Club, the Secret Life of Energy Storage. This series will highlight current and future uses of energy storage and, um, and how it decarbonizes um, our electric grid with major implications to electrifying mobility, accelerating renewable energy deployment on the grid and enabling energy resilience. First, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Noelle. Over to you, Noelle. Thanks, Johanna. Hi, everyone. I'm Noelle Bakhtian. I work at the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I'm executive director of the Energy Storage Center, which created this field trip series. I'm so excited to welcome you today as well with our Slack partners on this journey to an amazing net zero home that uses energy storage to achieve its goals. One of the reasons we founded this series was to help the public and researchers alike get a good look at how energy storage is used in real life and to understand the opportunities and challenges that we need to address together. So with that, back to you, Johanna, and have fun, everyone. Thanks, Joelle. Each tour showcases real-world applications of energy storage, provides a discussion on related science and technology research, and includes an opportunity for you to ask your questions. Together, we're gonna to learn more about how energy storage plays a pivotal role across the sectors. Now let's kick off today's tour. Today's virtual tour will explore how energy storage can help us reach net carbon zero emissions from our houses. We're going to start by touring a net carbon zero single family home today with our field trip tour guide, Dick Swanston. Yes, you're the tour guide, okay. who is the owner of this house and the founder and past president of SunPower Corporations. After the tour, we'll hear from two researchers. First, we're gonna hear from Gustavo Cesar, a staff engineer at Grid Integration Systems and Mobility called Gizmo Group at Slack, about the plans on how to scale up net zero houses to the community level. Then we're gonna hear from Dre Helms, a postdoctoral researcher in the Buildings Technologies and Urban Systems Division at Berkeley Lab, about what the future may look like in buildings with new generations of conventional energy storage technologies like thermal energy storage. We'll con conclude today's field trip with a live Q&A. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box throughout the entire tour and presentations. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the live Q&A. Also feel free right now to use the chat feature to introduce yourself to our tour group. We'd love to know your name, where you're joining us from, and the first word that comes to your mind when you hear energy storage for your home. So Dick. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so Dick Swanson, tell us a little bit about this house. Okay, this house um, came about because we realized some time ago that net zero energy does not mean net zero carbon. And uh, we wanted to sort of explore the boundaries of that and what it means. Uh, we uh, <laughs> realized that, that uh, if you're using fossil fuels at night from the grid to power your house, you're not at zero carbon. So obviously we had to bring storage into the picture. And so this house was created as a project to sort of look at the technical and economic aspects of that. Uh, what, what I found when first looking into it is that there's a lot of solar powered houses with battery storage off grid. Yeah. And it's a fairly common thing. What I was kind of amazed at is there's very little data. Like if, you, you know, you see these anecdotal things like, well, we built this off-grid house and the, uh, our utility bill went down, you know, to 20% you know, or 50%. It's of almost no use from a technical or economic point of view. So we, uh, we took a lot of data on this house. And by the way, I want to put a pitch in. We decided to put the papers, the white papers about it up on the website. Oh, great. But uh, my webmaster hasn't yet figured out how you do that. Well, so, when you do that, let us know okay, where they so are. I mean, we'll, I, 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 we'll help you advertise. So, uh, so there's a lot of data in there on how, how the house works. Great. 
what was the largest hurdle that you had to overcome? Well, uh, so, you know, the, the really, the biggest hurdles were sort of um, philosophical in how much energy efficiency we wanted to put into the house, uh, how uh, tight we wanted to make it from a building envelope point of view. You know, all, we looked at all the way from a passive house standard, very, uh, you know, essentially would require no energy during the winter yeah. uh, to doing nothing. And uh, interestingly, with all the modeling we did, we found that the Title 24 requirements in California are pretty much spot on. Mm -hmm. If you bring your house up to Title 24, as you would if you did a major remodel anyway, uh, you're pretty much at the optimum in terms of building energy consumption. And, and you know, you have to realize that when you're, when you're trying to limit fossil fuel consumption, uh, the winter is the problem. If you have PV on your house, you've got plenty of energy in the summer. Uh, you still want to figure out what to do with all that excess energy, and that's a whole different topic. But uh, it's the winter. Uh, the winter when you have the least sun and the most heat load. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. So, of course, we focused a lot on, on, on energy efficiency of the heating system and, and that sort of thing. We learned a lot, which I'll, which you can find in those papers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and before we get into the house, what was the total cost of the project? Do you remember? Uh, well, it was, I, I can tell you the total cost of the remodel was, I think, $130,000. Um, so it's not cheap mm -hmm. uh, to bring a house up uh, to, to code. But, you know, if, if you're selling a house and a new person comes in and wants to remodel, it makes a lot of sense because the house is way more comfortable yeah. than it was before, just from a human comfort point. The solar and battery system cost about $40,000. Let's take a quick tour okay. through the house before we see the PV array in the back. So can you tell us about um, what you did to seal up the house so you weren't losing heat? Yeah, so we, the first thing we did is we did a uh, air changes per hour pressure test on the house. Uh, it, it's called a blower door test. It measures how leaky the house is as far as uh, infiltration of, of outside air. And when they came and did it, um, the, the company that did it said it was the leakiest house they'd ever seen. Right? Uh, I don't think many people have taken that old track home built in 1948 uh, to, uh, and, and done a blower door test mm -hmm. on it. But it's, it was basically Swiss cheese. Okay, leaking everywhere. <laughs> leaking everywhere. The big things were the fireplace, which we, we ended up just plugging the chimney. And okay, yeah. Dispensing with that. But there were a lot of subtle things that were interesting. For example, all of the joints between the wall and the floor here were open. It, the air is getting into the crawl space below, so that when you had the floor door running, if you walked by a vent of the crawl space outdoors, it was like a hurricane wow. of air coming out there. So to deal with that, we ended up conditioning the crawl space. We basically sealed all the vents, conditioned that. That sealed up the house uh, from the bottom. What we didn't do is the sealing of the wall to attic joints, because that's a little harder. And uh, one of the things we would do if we were to do the house over again. So we took the air changes per hour from about 20 down to six by doing those sealing things, which decrease the energy load on the house from infiltration by that ratio also. Can you also explain uh, the heat recovery ventilation? Yeah, so here? this is one thing that, that uh, our uh, architects and, and designers really recommended. And I would, based on the experience, I would recommend it to anybody. It's, a, it's taking outside fresh air into the house, venting it through all of the vents you see in the sill, ceiling, exhausting it through the crawl space and then back out through a heat exchanger, mm -hmm. which recovers the, the heat uh, from it. And so the net impact is very little on your energy demand for the, but the positive feature is that the house is, has the freshest feeling. People comment on that when they come in, there's no stale air mm -hmm. feeling yep. uh, and that sort of thing. That's really important, especially if you're sealing the house really well. If you're well. sealing the house really well. In fact, it's required by code when you certain, reach certain air changes per hour. Uh, but um, whoever's considering doing this, 
It's a must do. <laughs> 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 Let's go to the kitchen. Okay. By the way, the heat recovery ventilator eliminates the need for the exhaust fan in the bathroom. Oh, wow. Which is a major source of uh, leakage, uh, either through, you know when the flapper doesn't work or when it's on, it's just exhausting house air. So uh, <clears throat> instead, if there's a minimum amount of air you keep circulating in the bathroom and you never have to have, the, same with the kitchen, like the exhaust over the stove. So when you're burning something. Right, right. right. <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of little benefits. This is the kitchen where we put in new energy efficiency appliances and that sort of thing, uh, like an induction stove top. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we probably don't have time to look at the laundry room, but uh, we also put, uh, I, I chose the, the washer dryer by just the highest energy star rate, oh. 50 OEs, right? And those, interesting is it's a company from Turkey called Blomberg. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a heat pump dryer and uh, very efficient washer. And I can tell you that the client thinks are just fabulous. I mean, it creates a, a completely different feeling in dry clothes than a conventional oh, really? dryer does, right? And uses way less, way less energy. Way less yeah, energy. yeah. Um, so why don't we get outside and okay. see the PV array? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we we elected to put um, the PV on in a shade structure like this, which you can see overhead, and used uh, bifacial modules so that we would get some benefit from the light that's reflected off the ground and gets on the back of the modules. I also like the uh, transparent modules, um, you know, that have a very um, pleasing look in my view, mm -hmm. rather than the conventional back sheet, white back sheet, aluminum gray modules. So yeah. this creates a real nice space. Um, we have a table and chairs there for you know, people. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that we ended up being, doing this, which I'm glad we did, is that the ray is fairly large for houses sizes. Mm -hmm. It has half the floor plan of the house. Okay. Uh, and so it's fairly heavy. And the structural engineer said we probably have to reinforce the attic to put this put on the ray three. on the yeah. roof. So we just put it here and it's worked out great. Yeah, it's beautiful. Definitely. Um, can you tell us initially about your plans of, of wanting to be off grid? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're off grid, you're not using fossil fuels by definition from the utility, right? right. So that was like an end point. Um, and um, it, it, at the end of the day, um, decided not to, to leave the breaker on. One reason was that I was interested in the output of the array for, to compare with modeling. Mm -hmm. And if you go off grid, as soon as the battery's full, which happens, by the way, at 10 o'clock this time of the yeah. morning, right, uh, the array shuts down and you don't really know how much it produced. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I wanted to leave that on. Uh, <clears throat> we can go off grid by just destroying the breaker. There is some confusion, which I'm not completely clear on whether um, we could have eliminated the inter interconnect wall and still make code. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps your people <laughs> know that answer. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion on the web about it. It's just kind of funny. But, um, uh, so any, anyway, we ended up being disconnected and we... How much did you sell back? Well, we, we, we used here about uh, 3,700 kilowatt hours a year we sell back about 7,000. So, so you can see the impact of trying to design to get through the winter. The array yep. is producing annually, uh, you know, twice as much as we use, right? And, and we're selling it and right. we're getting, a, uh, you know, what I think is a reasonable price for it right now. We get about five or $600 a year check back for the energy we sell. Uh, and so that's, that's nice. One more question about the PV array. I noticed that it's flat. Can yeah. you talk about why you decided to make it flat rather than angled? Well, but for one thing, it was just appearance. I mean, to make a nice safe shade structure. Secondly, modules have gotten so cheap that there's really no need, you know, in the early days of PV, we used to argue whether it should be latitude plus five degrees or latitude plus eight degrees, you know, to optimize. That doesn't matter. Anyone PV modules are cheap as roof now. And so they just put them on there. Secondly, um, it's interesting in that in the winter, which is the problem, as I mentioned, the real problem is cloudy days. 
we, yeah. this array will produce um, average during January about the same amount as the house uses. So average is okay. Problem is three or four days of cloudy days in a row, the batteries run down. So it's on those days, cloudy days, that you're really having to get the best you can. And in fact, the best you can on a cloudy day is pointing straight up. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So pointing straight up is not, it, it's not as detrimental as, as uh, we used to think it mm -hmm. was. Well, let's go see your okay. storage. So as people can see, we got two power, uh, Tesla power walls. How did you end up to going with um, Tesla's power walls instead of another option? Well, when we built this house, uh, we designed it in in, in seventeen. Um, they were by far the only the only option. <laughs> option, and they had a lot of the experience. And I would still go. With, by the way, it's been they've been fantastic. Uh, uh, but it's all rather standard now. I mean, this is nothing exotic. I mean, our installers you know, over fifty percent attach rate on new systems using Tesla power walls. Um, he's sticking with Tesla power, power walls because the reliability has been so good, but there's lots of other choices available now. So there's nothing terribly unusual about having, uh, you know, 26 kilowatt hours of storage um, in, a, in a house nowadays. Um, but um, at the time we did it, it was a little bit Okay. Okay. And and you decided to go with two power walls as you explore the options of, of right. Right. So we use or... the DOE model, the BOPT, which um, is an NREL supported uh, program that looks at building energy consumption and does an annual model on it. And but it doesn't conclude storage very well. So we coupled that with Home, the microgrid uh, modeling program, and basically just you know we varied all, everything. Array size, battery size, you know, and and explored that whole space about where we would require minimal amount of grid uh, support from the uh, utility, and that's where we came up with the uh, seven kilowatt array and twenty six kilowatt hours of battery. And how many kilo? Oh, you said twenty six. Twenty six. Great, great. Um, is there any safety concerns you had to consider when you were putting your power walls here versus you know, inside the garage or? Well, yeah. not at the time. Uh, you know, I didn't really worry about it uh, <laughs> but then it was after that you know there was a lot of concern about lithium ion fires and that sort of thing um in in retrospect um you know there's new there's new requirements uh on battery mounting uh you have to you know if they're interior there's a lot more requirements mm, yeah. in the and that sort of thing uh if they're near a window there's a lot more requirements but um at the end of the day um it's proved to be very safe. I keep an eye on, on uh, Tesla power wall fires and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, it's not to worry. Yeah, okay. I did have people tell me I was a complete idiot for putting a lithium ion battery anywhere near the house. Oh, you got a garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, this is a stuck of wall. So. Yeah. Um, so how does the power wall integrate with the PV system and they all integrate with the grid? Can you explain well, a little yeah, bit more about that? Sure. Well, there's several options you can do uh, with the Tesla system. Um, we, we use uh, what's called self-consumption mode. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the self-consumption mode is sort of mimics off-grid as much as possible. And it will run in off-grid if the utilities down, of course. But uh, in self-consumption mode, the PV array uh, first is used to power the house. If there's any excess energy, which is way a lot right now, it's going into the batteries. Mm -hmm. And if the batteries are full, it's sending that with excess then back to the utility. And that's what we're getting the 500 to 600 volts a year uh, rebate on. Um, if the uh, grid goes down, of course, it flips into a backup, a backup mode. How long can you go with sort of in blackout mode? Well, in, it, it differs between summer and winter because in the winter we have a lot more heating load. It's on the order of two days mm -hmm. of, of autonomous, yeah. what, what they, in this they call autonomous operation. Um, and uh, uh, it, 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 but we can get through a cloudy period much longer than that because the two days assumes there's no generation. Oh, okay. We get some even on the cloudiest days, and we can go four or five days typically. 
Uh, and then when it when it gets really bad, that's when we've had to draw on the order of 150 kilowatt hours a year mm-hmm. off the grid. Uh, if, if we had been truly off grid, we would have just been down. 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 And in the summer, like, can you last weeks? Uh, well, in the summer, you use about half as much energy in the house uh, as you do in the winter. Um, and so we could go for four to five days. Okay, nice. Um, do the batteries lose charge if they're just sitting around? Is that noticeable at all? I have all? no idea because um, they're all hooked to the PV array. Okay, <laughs> so they never <laughs> they just never, sit around. They're always no, working, they're always right, working. Right. I can guarantee you, I haven't looked at my app, but they're at 100%, right? Okay, because it is very sunny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so looking a little bit sort of into the future um, and your future plans, what, what do you want to tackle next? What big energy or, or um, sort of global issue do you want to tackle next? Well, <laughs> that's that's an interesting question. We, we uh, you know, when we realized that we were not net zero carbon, we tackled this and then it suddenly occurred to me that we're not off grid. Yeah. We're actually using the sewer systems. We're using water piping, water purification systems. So um, right now uh, at BBNY, we're looking into uh, water mm-hmm. and, and trying to, minimize the use of, um, of water and, and uh, extracting water from the air. It's called atmospheric oh, okay. water harvesting. Mm-hmm. Water is uh, very important in California. It is. And the goal there, just like it was in PV originally, when we were 200 times too expensive at the beginning of uh, the, the PV era, uh, we met we met where it was uh, cost effective. Uh, in fact, by some measures, the cheapest form of energy, um, atmospheric the harvested water is more expensive than um, what you can get out of the tap, but not a lot. Oh, okay. We think, and and, and interestingly, there's a, the difference between wholesale electric power and and uh, electric power that uh, uh, the consumer sees is you know is like like a factor of four or five mm-hmm. difference, and that difference is largely transmission and distribution cost. And it's the same. I was kind of surprised. The same is true in water. That the the water utility charges it pays a certain amount for the water it gets and charges you about five times as much here at the house and that's all distribution cost. So um, there's hope. There's hope. <laughs> yes. Okay. We'll talk in ten right. years. Right. Um, so we know we didn't get a chance to go in the garage, but you don't have a, an EV charger in the garage. Right. Right. Um, how would you have your plans with the, the PV and the number of Tesla walls you have? Um, mm-hmm. changed if you had, had um, an, an EV charger? Well, one of the things we've learned is that having vehicle to grid capability is like super, a no brainer. And um, everybody should be pressing for that, uh, both technically and, and policy wise. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we had had an EV, um, we certainly could have gotten a, away with roughly half as much PV and, and one of these types. Okay. Uh, and it would have been, been fine. I think wh- one of the things with, with the EVs is that um, you really want to charge them during the day mm-hmm. when we have solar on the grid and, and often the solar is having to be curtailed. So it makes total sense to be plugging EVs in. Um, but uh, at night when most people are home, yeah, it doesn't make sense. So I think one of the enabling things will be to facilitate charging at work, for example, people that work during the day, and then they can bring that power home. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so on a cloudy day, you can use your car. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, but, you know, for example, my Tesla's got a, a hundred kilowatt hours. I mean, this is only 26. Yeah. So it, it would be like trivial for my Tesla to run this. In the house. house wow. Wow. Um, so one last question, um, as we're looking to scale, you know, from one single house to the community level, um, in your opinion, is it better to retrofit like you've done here or um, at the community level, should we really be thinking about new housing? Well, I think it's both. Um, the, uh, we have so many houses, we have to look at retrofit. And I'm absolutely certain that if we get a, an industry going of deep energy retrofits, um, the cost will come down. I mentioned the cost. Uh, but a lot of that cost was just architecture and engineering costs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, much of that cost, if we were to do it again, it'd be a lot less. And if everybody got involved in it, it would be way a lot less. You know? And I think people would figure out you know, what's the cost effective thing to do uh, as far as bringing the energy uh, yield down the PV and battery parts kind of, you know, we know how to do yeah. it. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Thank you so okay, much. This you. was a great tour. Well, thank you for coming um, here. And, you know, audience, if, if you have more questions um, that we didn't get to, um, please put them in the box and we'll learn a lot more during the Q&A. All right. Um, well, so excited to hear the experts talk too. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're going to hear from the researchers. Um, first, let's join Gustavo Cesar, a staff engineer in the Grid Integration Systems and Mobility Gizmo Group at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. He's going to tell us more about his plans or plans to how to scale from a single zero carbon house to the community level. All right, so I guess I'm on and hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, and so I'll start off by saying, uh, again, Johanna right introduced. So uh, I work at Gizmo, Green Integration Systems and Mobility, uh, which is a group within the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, and so to start off the talk, I'll, uh, I'll just give a brief introduction about what we do and why we uh, work on this space. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the challenges in scaling uh, the net carbon zero concept. Um, and also a couple of projects that we have that we're actually deploying these type of technologies and the algorithms that we developed to, uh, in order to be able to achieve such a goals, which includes net carbon zero, but also support grid operations. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, this is the old grid and how it usually and how it uh, operates uh, operated back in the day. So we have a big bulk generator and power is flowing from generation to transmission line and that's the substation distribution and then all the way to the uh, customer. Um, but um, more and more we've seen the deployment of electric vehicles and um, the tour that Johanna and Dick uh, provided to you guys showed a lot of the technologies that are being deployed at the customer level. Um, and so not only that, we're seeing a lot of uh, renewable generation being uh, added to the transmission and also distribution. So the new grid looks like uh, this picture here. So we have multiple distributed energy resource or DRs uh, behind the meter, in front of the meter, and most of them are cloud connected. So there, there are multiple ways of uh, communicating with them, controlling, reading the information, being able to uh, do better forecasts uh, on, uh, on the generation and also the load side of things. Um, one other thing that is actually um, happening is the customer behavior. So customers are changing their behavior and, and how they are uh, working um, and operating with respect to the grid. Um, and so this also needs to be accounted um, into the whole framework of net carbon zero. Um, and so because of that, uh, that's how our group is structured. There are three main pillars. One is focus on the grid modeling part of it. The middle one is DR. So how can I integrate DRs on the piece of, uh, on the grid as a whole? And then the third piece is the mobility. So primarily focus on transportation and electric vehicles. Um, and so within all these, uh, within the three pillars, we have two other ones that came after the realization of everything is cloud connected. So there has to be cybersecurity because if someone is able to attack, for example, Tesla server, they can actually discharge all the batteries at the same time or charge all the batteries at the, at the same time. And from an operations perspective, you can start creating a lot of problems in the infrastructure itself. Um, and so cybersecurity is a key component, something that we are heavily uh, working on. And then um, when you're collecting a lot of data, you need to be able to store the data, you need to be able to manipulate the data and how to uh, operate uh, and run all your systems. So algorithms, forecasting, optimization, and so on uh, without uh, the computing infrastructure that you need. Um, and so our group has three main pillars and then the two uh, supporting pillars uh, that, that we call. Um, so now uh, speaking a little bit more about the net homes and net scale. So there are um, multiple drivers towards a net zero concept. And based on our experience, I'll be focused on four. So home electrification, government subsidies, emission goals, and advancing uh, communication uh, and cloud computing. Um, and so, however, these drivers bring multiple challenges. They're intrinsically coupled uh, and can, it can be work on isolation in order to reach the net zero. So, we have to account for all of them so that we can make this work. Um, and so in the home electrification, what are the main challenges? So grid infrastructure overload. If we, if one of the key concepts on the net zero is transitioning all the gas generation in your homes to electrical. Um, and so there's a lot of work uh, being uh, shown. So City of Palo Utilities, uh, Kevala, which is, uh, was a consulting company that did a work for California Commission showing the impacts on the infrastructure if we start transitioning uh, all the electric appliances, uh, all the apply gas appliances to electric ones. And so there's heavily uh, uh, infrastructure overload and it causes uh, 
transformer explosions and also overload of circuits. So you can see here on this screen, um, so the hot spots on uh, a circuit breaker um, showing the overload of that system. The other one is government subsidies. So there is a lot of subsidies that people can leverage from the government, but um, it's still expensive for the average person. And one of the key things here is uh, the installation challenges. So from our experience in doing deployments in the field, um, if we try to attack the address the equity issue, we go to the advantage communities um, or even median income communities. Um, but one of the things that we found that, that we found is actually um, permit in order to install those devices, you need to go uh, and get permits and also inspection from the building uh, uh, office. Um, and so uh, if your system, if your home electrical system is not uh, properly well wired and have all the permits, you face a lot of barriers. And so on this uh, picture here, we show a common mistake that we see in multiple residential panels. And it doesn't matter if you're low income, mid income, high income, uh, you see this all over the place. So double tapping uh, breakers. Um, and so in order to install uh, a battery system, for example, you need to do the inspection. Once the inspector comes and say, okay, you have to fix these things before I can issue the, the inspection. So there's a lot of challenges uh, on the installation part of it. Emission goals, um, there is no clear definition of what net zero means and how to use uh, emission values. And one of the key problems here is being able to cherry pick whatever works best for your case. Um, and so there's a, a great article uh, that was issued at Stanford GSB, uh, which is called Our Big Companies Net Zero Pledge is a Well-Intentioned Shell Game. Um, and so this is a very interesting article. And uh, here in this graph, I'm showing on the left-hand side, the average emissions profile from the grid. This is California data. And then the marginal emissions profile. So which one you would use depending uh, on whether I'm charging my vehicle in the morning or charging the, in the evening. Um, so if I charge in, in, uh, in the middle of the day, for example, um, I can look at the average emission and say, okay, I'm good, uh, net carbon zero, uh, the grid is very clean. But then if I, if I actually look at the marginal emissions, uh, I might actually uh, be on the opposite. So we need to have a clear definition and standards on how to use each of those uh, metrics. Um, and so the other piece that vents uh, in cloud computing um, and so in communications, but one of the key challenges is actually implementing that in practice. So we see a lot of challenges with latency on communication performance, uh, performance, accuracy, reliability, and int integration. So here's just one example. So the orange curve is showing uh, the signal that we send to one of our units that we have in the, in the lab, and the blue one is actually showing the response. So we can see there's a lot of delay on the response. We are not tracking the signal very well. Um, and so there are multiple challenges on the system, uh, on the operation of the system in real world conditions. And so that's another challenge. Um, but all of this um, is uh, very uh, important for us to address. And so one of the reasons why we built this lab that I'm here today at Slack. So um, I have a picture of the lab, but also I'm here and I can show. So we have a Sonnen uh, uh, battery system here. We also have the same system that uh, Dick has in, the, in his home from uh, Tesla Powerwall. We have two solar uh, systems with different technologies. One uses string array, the other one uses microinverters. And I can dive into the technical details uh, on the Q&A uh, about each of these. We also have multiple outlets and, you have, and we have two charging stations outside of the lab. Um, and this is just like a single line diagram of how the system, uh, how the electrical system is broken down here in the lab. So two experimental homes, different uh, hardware, similar hardware, but from different manufacturers so that we are looking uh, into being hardware agnostic, right? So I don't care if I have a Tesla Powerwall, if you have a Sony, if I have Enphase, whatever, um, if there's a way for us to integrate and develop algorithms to help you achieve the net carbon zero, uh, reduce your uh, cost of electricity, and so on, uh, that's the focus of our research here. Um, we also have a sister lab that we call at Stanford. Um, and, and so we have similar setup, but at Stanford, one thing that we have is uh, a grid emulator. So this uh, big box here, uh, we can actually um, play with the information that we get from the grid. So instead of being like a split phase 120, 240 volt, 60 hertz frequency, I can actually add some sags and swells to the voltage uh, and current. Uh, voltage and frequency and see how the system would uh, respond uh, to those uh, sags and swells. Um, and so we also built a user interface and a platform that we can collect data. Uh, we can also uh, test algorithms and see in real time what's happened. So this is uh, the SGMP platform that we have running in our lab here uh, at Slack. 
Um, and so we can see that we're monitoring uh, how much solar we're generating, how much load we're consuming, battery when it's charging and discharging, uh, the EV load, so the EV is purple. Um, the blue curve here is uh, how much you're consuming from the grid and the bars here are solar, the blue ones and the yellow ones are battery charging. Um, and so we're able to monitor this in real time. And this is actually what's happening today here in the lab. We're running a lot of tests with the batteries uh, right now. So we can see there are times that we're charging the batteries while we have EV load and also we have other loads uh, here. Um, and the other piece that we have in the lab is a real time monitoring system. So this one, we can get second level information. The previous one, SG, SGMP, we have around like five second uh, data and we're displaying at every five minutes. I mean, so this one here, we can literally see all the breakers that we're monitoring in each of the uh, sub panels that we have, um, and we can see all the real time information. Um, and so I'll talk now about really briefly about two projects. I know I'm running out of time. Um, and so the first big project that we have is called PowerNet. So uh, the main focus here is coordinating the DRs at scale uh, from the cloud. And so, as I mentioned, we broke down this project into the cloud coordinator and the home hub. So the cloud coordinator does the synchronization across the meter and the home hub is, is our local intelligence. And so effective coordination needs to deal with four main points. So power grid constraints, I can't overload a transformer, otherwise it's gonna accelerate aging and blow up. Um, cloud communication network constraints, user preferences, uh, and also scalability of deployment. Um, as part of this project, we uh, ran a, a bunch of tests in the, in the two labs that I mentioned. So this one here is just showing the ability of our algorithm to track a signal and how to operate turn on and off the loads uh, so that we are able to track the signal. Um, and then we expanded that uh, from 10 homes that we built in the lab to uh, close to 14,000 homes in the simulation um, so that we can show the capability of the system at scale. Um, and here is some of the algorithms that we played in the lab here at Slack. And so the whole point was, um, so the top one is what the optimization does. So the uh, green curve is the battery, the red one is solar, and the blue one is the load that we are having, primarily EVs. And on the middle graph is just the net load when we're optimizing, and the bottom one is uh, the net load without the optimization. And so the, the problem was try to do a cost minimization. We had a penalty for exporting power back to the grid um, and a few constraints on the battery. And so we achieved a savings of around 5%, primarily because of the rate structure that we had set up here, which is a standard home uh, time of use rate. Um, and so the key points is what is better, hovering around zero, but with small amplitude, like in the middle graph, or being zero most of the time, but having large spikes uh, from, like in the bottom graph. And also from emissions perspective, um, if I use average emissions, which one is better if I use marginal emissions? So these are all things that we're trying to account for in our uh, strategies to control the loads. We also did deployment in the homes. We installed uh, batteries and monitoring system in 14 homes uh, in Fremont. On the right, uh, we're showing one of the homes that we have, uh, and then the bottom one is another home. So different um, usage, uh, different appliances, uh, and different behavior from people. So there's like different clusters of people that you can uh, put them together and say, okay, this person uh, belongs to this cluster more or less based on their behavior and so on. So be the behavior part is also very important. Um, we also did a deployment in the farm. Um, and so we field tested our system uh, in, by managing batteries, solar, and uh, the load controllers, which uh, primarily operates the fence. Um, and so a couple of the results here, we reduced electricity costs from the dairy farm uh, over uh, around 90%. Uh, we reduced emissions near net zero carbon free for the month of July. Um, and we also provide a user interface because at the end of the day, you can't see electricity. You just see the cost at the end of the day. And so for, from a farmer's standpoint in the operation part of it, uh, it's very relevant to know what uh, what fans are working or not because that impacts their milk production at the end of the day. Um, and the last product is TAS, it's called Transactive Energy Service Systems. And primarily uh, this project, uh, uh, the whole point is implementing a true transactive system. And so this has not been demonstrated in the field, primarily the ramping price and the storage price. Um, and this is a project funded by the DOE under the connected communities. Um, we are working with New Hampshire and Maine, and the goal is having between 100 and 250 homes with uh, smart devices, uh, battery and storage systems, EVs, um, and doing all the coordination uh, using a transactive system. Um, so I'll stop here. I think I'm done with time um, and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gustavo. Um, yeah, we look forward to having the opportunity to ask all those questions we have. So please put them in the Q&A box. Um, next, for this uh, coming up portion of the event, let's join Dre Helms. Um, they are a postdoctoral researcher in the Buildings Tech Building Technologies and Urban Systems Division at Berkeley Lab, bit of a mouthful, <laughs> for a presentation about what the future may look like in buildings with a new generation of conventional energy storage technologies like thermal energy storage. Take it away. Should I mute myself for this? Awesome. Thank you so much, Johanna. Um, let's get in presenter mode. Okay. Uh, can you flip the screen? Uh, yes, my, there we go. How's that? That looks great, thanks. Okay, perfect. So I'll jump right in. Um, one of the, the key things uh, that I think we need to, to focus on um, is energy used for heating and cooling. So 60% of the energy that we use in residential buildings is in the form of heating and cooling. So you can think about hot water, air conditioning, heating, refrigeration, and uh, these bar graphs, and, and hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, these show elec uh, electricity use in residential buildings and also in commercial buildings. And you can see that heating and cooling already use a substantial portion of building electricity. So if we consider uh, switching the remainder of our energy source, um, kind of shown over here in this pie chart in the bottom right, uh, from natural gas to electricity, we're going to have even more um, electricity use for these heating and cooling appliances. So you can think uh, hot water heater, dryer, cooking. Um, basically, the electric demand is going to grow. And so since energy for heating and cooling already causes this peak electric demand, and it's going to do, uh, it will do so even more as heating is decarbonized, we actually have a really big problem for the grid. So the grid is not prepared. Um, for heating to be electrified. And so one way that we can address this is to align renewable energy supply, um, such as solar, which is kind of shown here in, in this figure as this yellow line. Um, we can align this renewable energy supply with a more flexible demand. So the, the appliances that are actually using energy, let's try and match supply and demand. Um, so how do we do that? We can turn to energy storage. Um, you're probably familiar with several types of devices for energy storage. Um, I like to group these into four broad categories. Uh, so electrochemical, think batteries like the Tesla Powerwall, or even the electric vehicle itself. Um, thermal, through a material that's good at staying hot or cold. Uh, chemical energy storage, including cleaner fuels like hydrogen and mechanical energy storage uh, with pumped hydro and compressed air as popular examples. Um, so Berkeley Lab, we have this amazing facility where we can test these different storage technologies. Um, so I'm gonna promote Flex Lab a little bit as a place where I've done research. Um, Flex Lab, uh, which is shown here as, as these uh, blue buildings, is this advanced building technologies and grid integration facility um, where you can basically test all sorts of building technologies. Um, so Flex Lab has been in operation for seven years. Uh, they've, they've already conducted 60 plus R&D projects. Um, and the focus at Flex Lab is to test under real world operating conditions. And so you can kind of see uh, in this photo, we have a number of test beds. We have the rotating test bed and uh, three other test beds here, which have identical test cells that are side by side. Um, and so users can come and do these comparative tests where in one test cell, you might uh, test a particular, maybe standard HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. And the, in the other test cell, you might test a new one um, to kind of evaluate the performance and see if you can do uh, better by changing things up. So that's some of the research that we do at the lab, which I think is really cool. Um, and it's not just us as lab researchers who can use these facilities. External researchers can actually also get involved and do R&D projects here. Um, so if you're interested in using a facility that has thousands of sensors to do decarbonization studies, this is a great place uh, to come and do it. So one of the technologies that I've tested in Flex Lab 
is thermal energy storage using phase change materials or PCMs. Um, so for folks in the audience who might not be familiar with PCM, um, ice is a great example. So you will probably already consider ice to be a great material for thermal energy storage. Let's say you're going to a park, you wanna keep your food and your drinks cold, you stick ice in your cooler uh, and you can keep, keep that stuff cold for a long time. Um, so the cool thing about other phase change materials besides ice is that they offer this benefit of phase transitioning, um, so melting and freezing at temperatures that are ideal for building applications like space cooling, uh, space heating, and water heating. Um, so this bottom figure is uh, some experimental data from the lab, from, from this test setup actually, um, which is showing how warm water can enter this thermal energy storage device and it leaves at this much cooler temperature. Um, and basically it's rejecting heat into this phase change material, which is uh, melting at 11 degrees Celsius. So we're getting cold water and we can use that cold water to cool our building. Um, another great thing about phase change material is that it's energy dense. So you can store a lot of energy in a very small volume. Uh, and this is really important when we're retrofitting existing buildings. Um, which we're going to have to do a lot of as we decarbonize the grid. Um, so we're calling that the goal is to enhance demand flexibility. Uh, my team designed these integrated systems that are capable of shifting heating and cooling loads to times when electricity is clean and cheap. Um, so let's consider heating mode for this home in Massachusetts. Um, I have a heat pump here at the left hand side of the screen, which pulls thermal energy from the outside air and puts it into water. And then hot water from this heat pump can flow into uh, these thermal energy storage devices and charge up the phase change material by melting it. And then later, when a room needs to be heated, so it's a cold winter day, occupants want to stay warm, uh, that warm water can come from the thermal storage and directly serve this fan coil unit, which is just an air to water heat exchanger. Um, so here's, here's the type of integrated systems that I've been working on in my research. Um, and in addition to that residential system, I've also been working on commercial systems. And so what you're seeing here is a compact prototype that we plan to install on an office building actually at FlexLab. So hopefully the FlexLab staff will be comfortable. Um, and this system also includes a heat pump shown over here, uh, phase change material, thermal energy storage, and a fan coil unit. So very similar to the residential system I just showed. Uh, the main difference here is that these technologies are not ser also serving water heating loads because there's no sinks or um, any sort of hot water needed within the actual office space. So it's been super fun to build this prototype that we designed. Um, and I'm going to show you some pictures, and then I'm going to do a little tour, and hopefully it's not too choppy. Um, but basically in these pictures, starting at the left, and you're going to see some of these devices in a second, um, you can see a heat pump. Um, and the controls for this integrated system in this bottom box. Um, in the center pane, we have two phase change material thermal storage batteries uh, with inlet and outlet piping so that they can connect to the heat pump and, and connect to the fan coil unit. So I'm going to try to do this screen switch. Uh, Johanna, if you want to <laughs> support me here. Yeah, no problem. So while he's while they're getting started um, with switching to a mobile device, um, I think everyone can take a moment and add more Q and A um, to the Q and A box, um, and hopefully we'll be able to see this in real life. Excellent, we can see you. Yep. Okay, and you can hear me too, right? We can hear you. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm just going to give a quick tour, hopefully not too choppy, of those devices that I just talked about in this integrated system. Um, so here we've got the air to water heat pump where air is kind of being drawn in through these fans and thermal energy is being added to or uh, rejected um, from that air or to that air, sorry. And that's being transferred to water. And water is is what's coming out of the back of the heat pump here. Um, so this heat pump interacts with this thermal energy storage cart. Oh. 
kind of back out so you can see it. Um, and so we have these two thermal batteries. The one in the front is the cold thermal storage, and then the one in the back is the hot thermal storage. Um, so these are for space cooling and space heating. And then we're bringing water into and out of those thermal batteries uh, through these pipes. And then this cart is interacting with the heat pump and with the fan coil unit through this balance of plant. So what you can see over here is some valves, a flow meter, and a pump. Um, and that's, that's how basically we can charge up the storage using the heat pump and then discharge the storage uh, to serve this fan coil unit. So up top, we've got a fan, which is delivering energy uh, through cool or hot air to a space. And then this fan coil unit here is a water to air heat exchanger. So water is coming in and out. That water is hot or cold based on what we need. Um, and yeah, this is, this is the entire integrated system. So I'll stop my tour here and I'm excited for Q&A. Thank you so much, Dre. Um, now let's have all the panelists come back on screen and um, we can start responding to the questions in the Q&A that we have. Um, we've got lots of questions already. Um, hello, Gustava. Dre's back on and hopefully we'll get Dick on. Um, so while we wait for Dick to come back on and get his video working. Um, I have a question um, from Justin Cook. Um, Justin's asking, EV drivers learn to drive differently simply because of better feedback from energy consumption to the users. What are the changes, what are the changes users do once a home is net zero? So I don't know if, um, Dre or Gustavo want to talk about that? Yeah, I can chime in here. Um, so the, the behavior is actually one of the hardest problems uh, that we have to solve. And so in one of my slides, I showed um, how you coordinate the battery plus solar to charge an EV and additional loads. And as you can see, the battery is not the best device to charge an EV because, um, again, most of these batteries that we connect in the home, so the stationary storage, they are around roughly seven and a half to eight kilowatts. Um, the energy size, you can scale that up, but the power rating, you're somewhat limited based on the inverter that you have in your uh, system. Um, and so when, it, when EV start charging, if you have a level two charger, for example, it's around like 7.2 uh, kilowatts, right? So in, uh, in the batteries that we have in our lab, it depletes in around like an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and so if the homeowner is expecting to be net carbon zero and charge the EVs at home, it, it's not a, an easy way to do it. And that person needs to really understand the dynamics that play around. So I might not have my EV fully charged if I'm charging overnight because I have the battery. Um, and if I try to be net carbon zero, my battery will be depleted and I might have maybe half of uh, or 70 to 80% of my EV charge. Um, and so there has to be an understanding from the homeowner's perspective as well, that the battery is not like infinite. So we have a limited capacity from the energy standpoint, also from the power standpoint. Um, and so there has to be some education uh, over there as well. So I don't know if that addressed the question, but the behavior part is one of the most challenging ones, I would say. Yeah, Dre, did you have anything else to add? Or yeah, so I would just say as someone who currently lives in an apartment building under time of use electricity pricing, um, I know when PG&E peaks are happening, I turn off my devices. So I feel like you can already train people just through cost. Um, and as we shift to more electrified technologies that that, that will continue to work. Excellent. Dick, I have a question for you. Um, if someone wants to do what you did to their house, what's their first steps? Um, and, and hopefully it's something simple, like look up these three companies online, or is there a checklist online that they can, you know, the how to and, and what's the first thing to do? Uh, you need to unmute, sorry. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I think what you want to do is, is employ an architect that's experienced in uh, passive houses and that sort of thing. 
the, the company we used was called FGNY in Palo Alto, and they were very knowledgeable and really helped us through the whole thing. In addition, the installers, both the battery and the PV installers, can help you a lot. Uh, so I think between, uh, between the PV and battery installer and an architect that's going to help you with the deep energy retrofit, um, you're good to go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Dre, I have another question for you. Um, what is the energy offset equivalent saved from the PCM, TES, and the FCU residential unit? And this is um, from Petri Petrice Horner. Okay, energy energy equivalent offset. Offset. Um, so I'm not quite sure not quite sure how to answer that question because basically what's happening is that we're shifting we're shifting that energy use to a different time of day um, and the benefits of shifting that energy use are associated with the energy supply at that time. So let's say you're able to shift the energy use to a time when it's all wind or all solar uh, locally or on the grid, then your benefit is all of the greenhouse gas emissions that would have come from uh, using those devices at sort of the time, the original time that they would have been used. Um, if that, I hope that answers the question, but I'm happy to continue to follow up in like chat or over email. Great, thank you. Um, Dick, I have another question for you. Um, for batteries in the like zero carbon house, are there any programs that you found from the utilities that encourage batteries discharging power back to the grid during peak grid electricity hours, for example, in the evenings? Um, not that I found, but I read about a lot of interest in it. And so it's certainly, uh, it's certainly something that's coming. And uh, I think um, utilities and regulators really have to, uh, uh, scratch their heads and get get that whole area um, squared away. Uh, it, it it just makes total sense. I know that uh, you know I my my work a lot of my work was funded by utilities, and when we built this house, um, they put in since we put solar in, they um, re they gave us an upgrade on the service panel, so it went to a two hundred amp service panel free. So the utility really was benefiting, I mean, was encouraging us to do it. I don't think they realized that we were going to net sell them energy and also get paid $500 a year <laughs> rather than sell it, rather than buying any energy from them. But, uh, but sure, there's that, there's this, the uh, uh, self-generation incentive program and all these things. And, and again, all of the installers are very um, aware of all of these uh, programs and can help people through it. And John, if I can chime in here real quick, yeah. just back to what Dick mentioned. Um, so from a, a customer perspective, so from a homeowner or uh, Dick's example, for example, um, there is no, at least that I'm aware, there's no program like that. But if you're a Tesla or a Sun and you have the virtual power plant concept, so they can actually support the grid. And, it, and from the utility perspective, it's a lot easier because they talk with just one entity and they control all their assets. Um, but yeah, it's still like fuzzy, the environment over there, but I know the VPP, so the virtual power plants is a concept uh, addressing that. Piece. Yeah, I agree. I think the VPP is an exciting concept, but you also have to think in the future, as we get more and more residential PV on the system, it's going to have to be to come dispatchable. And uh, so I don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but obviously you can't generate more power than the grid is demanding. And, and it's not too far in the future where that could happen on some days. Excellent. Um, Dick, one more question for you. Um, what permits did you need and how long did it take for you to get them or complete the construction? Um, was there any special permitting issues um, to ensure that the system can operate uh, in an island mode? I assume that means like um, off some semi semi off grid, I guess, because you're not completely island. Um, no, be, because we had the smoke screen of having a utility interconnect. So um the permitting was very straightforward and went through completely of course all of the the pv system has uh an anti-islanding capability on it to protect the grid and uh and they were aware of that and, and that worked fine and the gateway for the battery the same so from the perspective of the city regulators and utility um there was essentially no problem with the system Great. And we are running out of time, but I want to ask um, everyone um, one final question, and that's um, sort of 
how will how in your minds will the grid look in 10 to 20 years and what issues um, should we be solving now that are going to affect the grid um, as more houses become generators of renewable energy rather than just energy consumption consumers so i don't know dre you want to go first uh, sure. Um, so I really hope that everything is electrified. I hope we are absolutely done with gas in 10 to 20 years. Um, and yeah, the, I think the huge challenge to navigate actually is around equity and like who, um, who gets included in this energy transition and who gets left behind. So who are some of the last people that are stuck with this aging gas infrastructure and having to spend a ton of money um, to, to meet their energy needs? So that's something that I hope uh, researchers and everyone continues to focus on. Um, and that's my piece. I'll pass it on. Gustavo, what do you think? Um, yeah, to me, two points. One, I think, is what Dre mentioned. The equity part is something very challenging, especially when you try to look at the electrical code and see the permits, uh, permits and all the installation requirements. Um, you have to do a lot of work to make sure that all the homes are actually in good standing uh, from the electrical standpoint. Um, and the second one for me is more the impacts on the distribution infrastructure, right? So electrification of all the appliances is fine, but then we need to couple that with the grid. And so if the infrastructure can't support that, so a lot of transformers are gonna be overloaded. And again, Cedar Quality Utilities issued a report where they say the costs, how many feeders, transformers, and so on will need to re be replaced if they reach their goals. And also the EV uh, penetration and the impact on the infrastructure, I think needs to be really, uh, it's a problem that really needs to be a thought really carefully uh, about it. So. Dick, any last thoughts? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think the, um, you know, what we explored is the, is this closest to off-grid end of the spectrum. Um, and certainly we're not placing any stress on the utility infrastructure by doing that, but it's clearly probably not the most cost-effective solution. Uh, alternatively, you could have all of the generation and storage assets at the utility side, and that's probably not the most cost-effective. And I don't think you can, you can figure this out by just doing Excel spreadsheets. I think we have to have everybody trying everything and see what we get traction with. So in the next 10 years, I would like to see people experimenting across the spectrum on how we solve uh, this naughty problem of getting to uh, zero carbon. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank special thanks to Dick Swanson, Gustavo Cesar, and Dre Helms for taking us on this awesome virtual field trip. Um, I'd also like to thank to all of those who have helped put this event together, especially behind the scenes. I'd like to particularly thank Sarah Price and Marianne Fives who have been working um, diligently behind the scenes to make sure today went off without a hitch. There was a lot of um, technical things we needed to, to iron out. In case you missed our first virtual field trip to the International Space Station where we spoke to the astronaut Kyla, Kayla Barron or our second virtual field trip where we explored how energy storage increases community resilience by touring the Bad River Band reservations who have deployed a microgrid which hosts the largest lithium ion battery project in Wisconsin and boasts the local site and tribal resilience. You can check both of those field trips out at the secret life uh, secretlifeofenergystorage.lbl.gov. I believe it's also been put in the chat. A recording of this today's field trip and information about upcoming ones are also available on the same website. If you have any ideas for future field trips, we'd love to hear from you. And we hope to see you at the next virtual field trip. Thank you very much.